special problems final exam. So um, I have the review sheet here open, but I also, before we get into that, I thought I would go over the format of the exam um, to let you know like how many questions and what they're worth. So you just bear with me for one sec because my computer was spinning as I tried to open um, the file. There it goes. Exams and quizzes. Just want to make sure I tell you exactly the right thing. Okay. So uh, there are 15 matching questions, matching a word to its definition. And those uh, 15 words come straight off the review sheet, like the vocabulary section. So 15 of those. And then there are 20 multiple choice questions. And those are worth two points each. And then finally, there are three short answers that I'm going to ask you to do to write. Um, I'll, I'll ask four questions, but you have to answer three of them. And those are five points each. So 15 plus 40 plus 15 equals 70. And that's the total for the um, exam is out of 70 points. Um, there is also a three point bonus question at the end. but. Uh, that is up to you if you want to answer that or not. So does that format make sense? Uh, 15 matching, 20 multiple choice, and three short answer. Okay. Um, in terms of general suggestions or, or, or does everyone, uh, was everyone able to find the review sheet? Does anyone need help me pointing out where the review sheet is? Okay, good. Yeah. Oh shoot. Um, can you can you like highlight it and paste it into a? I'm working on. Sorry. Um, I'm sure it's somewhere on the site as a doc, but I don't know where I put it in each format. Um, so, is there anyone who can't find the review sheet? Basically, you should be able to find it in the student resources folder, as well as uh the the last module like the week 14 plus or whatever 15 plus um folder i'm just double checking for you uh 15 plus sorry um oh yeah that's the one that's the pdf so i think student resources uh yeah it's in the it, it is in the student resources folder as a word More correct Correct. That's why I made sure to take enough time to find it so that you would have already done the work. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, why don't we switch to the computer, Laura, and I'll at least put it on the screen. Looks like this, right, when you find it. Um, the, so like I said, the uh, matching questions will, will come directly from this list of concepts to know. It is a lot of vocabulary. That's just kind of what you get in a like a lower level class. It's not intro, but it's still. Um, so there's a lot of vocabulary here. I will, like I said, I'll take 15 of these for the matching questions. But you know, honestly, one or two of them might show up um, in later questions on the test too. Just like in, you know, I might be using one of these words, so um, it's good to know all of them. And then the questions here are not the exact questions that will be on the test necessarily, but they are to guide your studying. Uh, and so you can see, um, let's see, where's one of the ones that here? Maybe, you know what, let me just make it a little bit bigger. Whoa, that didn't work. <laughs> there we go. Um, so for example, um, the population pyramid Right. Uh, if it was a multiple choice question, I can't just say what's a population pyramid. Um, it, more likely it would be something like um, uh, I would give you a true false question and I would say something like, you know, the, the purpose of a population pyramid is to um, understand trends in aging. Right. And that, that would be true as opposed to false. Right. If I had said it was uh, the purpose of a population pyramid is to understand trends in marriage. Right. That wouldn't be correct. So um, where's another one that's like a more of a study guide. Um, uh, ah, the two. So the two competing theories of the purpose of education in society. Um, you know, I want you to know each of them, status attainment and social reproduction. 
But if there were a short answer question, it would probably ask you about one of them. Like pick one and describe, you know, how it um, explains the purpose of education or whatever. So that's my like general advice uh, on the review sheet is to uh, use this to guide your studying, but these aren't the exact questions that will be on the test necessarily, whereas the vocabulary is the exact terms. And I can tell you that I'll take the um, definitions that are going to be, you know, presented to you, they come straight from the lecture slides, uh, which generally come straight from the textbook. So um, the textbook would be a perfectly fine thing to use as a you know, tool to define a lot of these terms, um, but you can use the lecture slides as well. All right, all that being said, I want to give you guys a chance to ask any questions you have or if you want me to go over things uh, one more time. I'll give you a minute to, to you know, let this sink in. Um, but does anyone have any specific questions about the test or about uh, anything on the review sheet? Oh, did I say out loud the, um, the dates for the exam? So in case I didn't, the uh, exam opens today. Um, I believe it, I think it did at one o'clock. Uh, and it is, you can have to take it between today and next Friday, the 17th of December. That's the last day of the semester, the 17th. So everybody has to take their, their exam by then. Um, if you used the lockdown browser for your midterm and you haven't like bought a new computer or whatever, you're fine to go for the final. You just have to you know, do what you did before to straight into the, the test. Um, if you got a new computer or like reinstalled your software or whatever, you might want to double check that you're ready to go with the lockdown browser. You just have to pull up, pull up the quiz and click on it. You don't have to hit start quiz, just see if it gives you that option. Right? If it's if the start quiz button's there, then you're ready to go. Is yours not? No. Or you're just I, laughing? I, my computer's broken. Okay. I just sent it away and I was really hoping I'd go back to the Bible. Okay. Well, if you run into issues, are you going to do it on the iPad? I don't think do it on the iPad. I think it's easy. Well, you don't think you can do it. I mean, technically you can, but As you do, no, I can't do technologically that. you can. I remember I checked a box that said this test can be taken on a tablet. Okay. It can't be done on a smartphone, I don't think, but it can be done on a tablet. That's just like me. But I also don't know if I could, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, well, reach out to me if you're running into tech issues, yeah. but. I'm going to see. I don't know. Do you know if I can do it the long time? The school computers, yes, they all have it, I believe. So, like downloading the right, I'm pretty sure they're all preset with it, so that you, for that purpose, that's, that's my help. Um, you can double check, like you can ask at the library, just double check with them. But no, I'm I'm like still getting used to, to using the iPad and like the touch screen and everything. Yeah, and the typing on the tinier keyboard. And like whether it's like clicking it or um, like I've taken a test. Okay. Gotcha. If it hits something else, or yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. So, and everyone, this goes for everyone. Right? Just keep me abreast of any technical issues. Tech support is your first bet, just because they're better at that than I am, but then I can like reset things or, or you know, whatever, if, if that's necessary. So I'll keep my eye on my email, don't worry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would just check at the library or the, you know, the computer, just be like, hey, I can take a test in here, right? So, um, but for most people, if you're using the same computer you used your midterm for, smooth sailing, no problems. <sighs> Yeah, sorry. Well, hopefully you'll get it back before the spring semester starts. Like, we'll just give it a big, a big goal, right? <laughs> um, so again, everyone uh, has to take it between right now and Friday the seventeenth, so a week from tomorrow. Uh, that's the last day of the semester, so I I can't give you more time than that. Um, especially if if grades are going to be in in time. Uh, for you not to get incompletes. So um, please make a point of scheduling yourself to take this exam before the 17th, before next Friday. 
Um, in terms of grading, I, I hope to be pretty quick. Um, the public issue projects are going to take me way longer than the exams will, just because of how in-depth they are. I'm going to work on those, and Jeremy's going to start with the exam, like multiple choice and all that. Um, and then I'll come back in for the short answers. So the, the final exam grades will come after the public issue project grades come. Um, and then uh, I would say, uh, like, from the last day, the 17th, I would say uh, all grading should be done before the holidays. Um, neither Jeremy nor I really want to spend, like, Christmas Eve grading, so I'm motivated to finish, you know, as quickly as possible. And so I want you guys to know that I'm going to try real hard. If there's a change to that schedule, I'll post about it on Brightspace, like an update on grading. But... Um, so my plan is to work on public issue projects right now while exams are coming in and then have them ready to go uh, about a week afterwards. Um, so that's my plan for timeline. Now we can go back to the are there questions? Do you guys want me to talk about anything in particular? Um, you know, this is your review session. What would you like to review? Give you a minute though to look all this over. There are a few folks, it's not just you, Shelly. <laughs> and it's okay if you don't have specifics, I can, you know, pick a couple of these to talk about if you'd like. Um, but I want to make sure everyone has that opportunity if they do have questions. Let's see. I would say if you want to focus your studying and you feel and you did well on the midterm exam, then this that that question the last question on the page, on the front side is the first question from the second half of class, right? Like from here on up, this question about marriage and sexuality, um, that this and up was for on the midterm. So if you did well on the midterm, there might be some questions, you know, still covering this material. But if you want to focus your studying on new material, this last question on the first page and then the second page are all of this, the, the uh, more recent material, the material since the, the midterm. Um, so maybe I will, let's see, we can talk about, I already talked about a population pyramid kind of, but that's, you know, again, that thing where it's gender on one side, like men and women and how old uh, they are. And then it's like how many people fill into that, each of those categories. Um, let's see. Yes, yes. Okay, so for education, hang on, I'm just pulling up my notes so that I don't misspeak. But, um, so the school to prison pipeline is the idea that the way that we treat students like who are disciplinary problems in school um, is not only similar to the way that they are treated as as people who are incarcerated later on in life but um, but that schools set up certain types of students uh, it tends to be poorer minority um, uh, yeah, poor, poor minority students not always but um, who sets them up to have records or like bad school, you know, like your permanent report kind of your permanent record thing, um, sets them up to be unsuccessful later in life and eventually end up in prison. Um, I want to pull up the official, where is the question? Um, Sorry, oh, that's why it's on the screen. I couldn't find the actual question because is there one on here specifically about the school of prison pipeline? There it is, yeah. yeah. I knew it was there somewhere. Um, so anyway, the, the school to prison pipeline is this, you know, me metaphor, right? Like a pipeline takes things from one institution to another, right? You know, from the water treatment plant to your house. Um, it takes, generally speaking, low income or students of color, uh, uh, it, it, students who do poorly at school um, also have a higher rate of arrest and incarceration after school, 
right? Uh, after school, it ends and they graduate and they become adults, right? So the idea that like zero tolerance policies at school or like um, overly like authoritarian kinds of punishments on students, uh, especially like, so like attendance policies is one example where poor students and students of color have a harder time just getting to school because of like family need or whatever. And yet, if they have so many absences, that starts um, like looking like a disciplinary problem, right? When really it's a poverty problem or something else. Um, but then, you know, they, they become primed for a lifetime where they're, you know, infractions and arrest and incarceration. Um, so, a, so a zero tolerance policy then would be, um, you know, where if you are caught breaking your rule, you get an automatic punishment without taking into account any sort of extenuating circumstances. So again, missing three days of school, right? Three absences, you get a suspension or whatever. Um, well, if those three days you missed school were because your mother was working and you had to take care of your, you know, young sibling, like, right? So, so like that, that kind of a thing. Um, does that kind of answer your question, Charlie? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the idea there. And you're right. It wasn't really, we, we didn't spend a lot of time on it in person, um, discussing. And then of course, this ties back to the, I think the, the top question on this page, which was like, what are some of the general social problems associated in this case with education? And one of those problems, you know, if the question was like, tell me a major social problem associated with education, one answer could be that we've developed a school to prison pipeline, right? Or that zero tolerance policies have led to a school to prison pi pipeline or something like that. Um, by the way, this is a great example of how it's a study question and not like a test question. If this were a test question, what are some of the major problems associated with all of these areas? Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's the whole test, right? That's the course. So if this showed up, it would be like, it might say that and then say pick one, right? Like, and, and chances are you picked the one that your public history project fell under, but you could pick whatever you wanted. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't ask you to do all of them ever in any, in any question. Um, but I might ask you, here's all of them, pick one and tell me about a problem related to it. Or I suppose there could be a short, uh, multiple choice question that's like, which area of social problems is this problem associated with or whatever. Um, so that's, you know, you know, you want to know a couple of the problems associated with each area, but uh, you really only need to be in depth understanding of one and chances are it's going to be the one that your public issue project was related to. So um, exactly. You play to your strengths. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to trick anybody. I want to give you room to shine, right? <laughs> Show me what you know. Um, how about other questions? Let's see. Well, I can talk about this last one because that was the last lecture we had last week and it might not be very fresh in your mind. Um, so the question is, uh, what are the two factors of social movements? Which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but that's how it was written in the lecture, the two factors of social movements. And that was um, whether they, how much change they wanted, like whether they wanted change at the like limited sense or radical sense. And then the other um, factor was the scope of the change, meaning was it supposed to be like change in an individual or change in the structure of society? And so those two factors how much change and the scope of the change, like combined, and that's how we got the four different kinds of social movements, like instrumental, expressive, reform, and revolutionary. Um, but it had to do with how much change and to whom the change applied. So that might be a tricky question, but that's the answer to that one. Um, the very last part of the very last lecture. Uh, here's another one that's pretty quick and easy to just kind of not memorize, but I, ooh, to memorize, yes. What is the fundamental cause of health problems associated, or excuse me, according to the fundamental cause theory? So there was a, a fundamental cause theory about health problems, and they said, there's one thing, 
that is the fundamental cause of all health problems. Does anyone remember what it was? Remember? No, it's all right, it's all right. You haven't studied yet. It is socioeconomic status. Your social class has a bigger effect on your health than any other single factor, including genetics, um, at least according to the fundamental cause theory, right? And then they presented their evidence and all that, and you, know, you can refresh your memory on that by going back, but um, that is one that's pretty easy to remember. If you see fundamental cause theory, it's your social class, your socioeconomic status. It's the fundamental cause of health problems. People who live in poorer neighborhoods, people who have lower income, uh, people who grew up in poverty have different, demonstrably different health outcomes than people who were raised wealthy or who can afford good insurance or who you know have have means today. Um, and so, so that is why they argue that the fundamental cause is really social class. Let's see, what is another one from the second half of class? Oh, here's one, how about, about families? The difference between the subjective personal definition of the family and the official legal definition of the family. That's this one. Um, the, the personal subjective definition of the family was like guided by emotion. Right, so who you think of as your family. Now that could be your blood relatives or, or legally you know, adopted or married right, relatives. Um, or it could be you know, your best friend who you think of as a sister. If, if the, it, what's important is the emotional bond, right? That, that's the definition of family that's more personal. Now, on the other hand, there is of course a legal official definition of the family and that um, is strictly um, people related by blood, by marriage, or by adoption, right? Those were the three areas that were, are legally understood to be family, right? Um, and so, you know, then this question follows up with like, what are the pros and cons of using, you know, the personal definition versus the official one, right? Well, I mean, you, can, you could answer this any way. There's not a right or wrong pro or con here. But, you know, given this, that the personal definition of family emphasizes emotional connection, like that, if that's what you're trying to understand, then using that definition of family makes more sense, right? But if you're the U.S. government or you're trying to measure, like, you know, what is, how many official marriages were performed or whatever, you know, like how big are the uh, legal families in the United States, you, you're not going to want to use that personal definition. You want to focus on the legal one. Right? Or if you're doing research that involves the census, right? the census uses the legal definition. So you can't use the other one if you're trying to use census data, right? So, I mean, those are just examples of pros and cons. If, if a question asked you about pros and cons, like a short answer question, as long as your responses were logical or like you defended them, you know, why you're saying this is a, this is a pro or con, you are likely to, to earn your points. Um, I'm not looking for a specific pro or a specific con. All right. Other things you'd like me to go over or questions you have. Let's see what's up here. Do you guys remember medicalization and demedicalization? So that fell under health and healthcare. And that was the idea that sometimes there are social conditions or whatever that become medicalized where the medical community sort of takes over ownership of a certain thing. So like the example of medicalization that I gave was alcoholism. Right, alcoholism for many, many years was just seen as like a failure of moral character or like a person just, 
you know, giving in or whatever. But eventually the medical community acknowledged that, you know, alcoholism and, and to be honest, you know, substance use disorder in general, right, was a medical condition that needed medical interventions, not just a failure of character or uh, something like that, right? And so alcoholism, addiction in general, became medicalized. It became adopted by the medical community in how we talk about it and how we treat it, right? Whereas other things have been demedicalized by the industry, by, you know, the medicine, the, the institution, right? So the example I gave for this one was homosexuality. Um, the condition, the, the orientation of homosexuality for decades was considered a mental illness. It was already medicalized, right? Homosexuality was, was um, identified in the DSM that the, the psychiatrists use, right, as a mental illness until 1973. And then in 1973, it began the process of demedicalization. It became removed from medical textbooks as a medical condition and became understood by everyone, you know, those in psychology and, and related fields as simply a, you know, a social, uh, sexual orientation, just like heterosexuality or any other. Um, so that's medicalization and demedicalization. Does that one make sense? I think, did we have criminalization and decriminalization, or was that my other class? I apologize. No, my other class. <laughs> I teach sociology of deviance, too, and that's a, that's a term that can sometimes show up in, in both classes. But um, Let's see. Authoritarianism, we talked about that, yes, last time. What about, I'll do one more, and then if there aren't any, I mean, I don't want to drag it out, but I also want to make sure everyone has time to think about questions, if they have any. Um, so let's see, I know I've been jumping around a lot. Uh, here's another kind of easy one in terms of if you look up the lecture. Um, so what are the basic social institutions that a society first develops, and what um, are the more advanced or complex ones? So the basic ones that a uh, society first develops are government, economy, religion, family, and education. I'll say them again in a minute, but there's five of them. Government, economy, religion, family, and education. And those are the first social institutions because they are designed to meet our most basic social needs, right? A form of government because we need to be able to have rules and leaders, right? A form of, um, ed of education so we know we can pass on knowledge to the next generation, right? So those are the basic social institutions, those five. But lots of other institutions develop have can and have developed in societies afterwards. Um, for example, uh, medicine is is an, an, a um, sorry, why is my brain not working? Institution, uh, a more complex institution. The military is another social institution. Science, um, the media. Um, oh, I don't know. Autom. I don't know how to put that. Um, so it's not really an institution. Transportation maybe is an institution. Um, but anyway, they, those are the more advanced and complex. They come later. They still meet social needs, but like well, social needs that we develop after we started becoming more complex, right? Like those other five are the basics for like survival as a, as a species and as a, as a um, civilization, right? Does that make sense? So that's a, you know, it's a pretty easy one to look up and memorize, right? Any other questions? Let's see if I have any email questions. Oop, nothing there. 
So again, uh, there are 15 matching and they come straight from the top of this sheet. There are 20 multiple choice, which are two points each, the matching or one. And there are four, sorry, three <laughs> uh, short answers for five points each. I will ask you four and you can just pick whichever three you wanna answer. And there is a bonus question if you are so inclined as well. Once you start taking the exam, you have to do the whole thing at once. You can't like save it and come back later. Um, so make sure, I would say most students are done after about an hour, um, but if you budget yourself an hour and a half, that should be plenty of time. Technically, you have two hours and 45 minutes, and even then you can still finish. It just marks it as like you took a long time. I don't care, right? Uh, uh, don't worry about how long it takes you, um, but do keep in mind that it is closed book that is on the honor system. So. You can't use other materials, but you can take as long as you need to try to come up with what you want to say in those short answer questions. Does that make sense? All right. So anyone out there, Mimi, Brenda, Ariana, any questions? I don't want to force you, but okay. All right. Well, I wish everybody the best of luck on their exam. Um, like I said, I will try to get them graded, you know, the public issue projects right now, try to get those graded this week and into the weekend and then turning to the exams after that. Um, you should probably have a grade by the holidays. And I really appreciate everybody's time this semester. I think we had some really good discussions. Um, reach out if you have any questions about social science courses or something like that if you want to talk. But otherwise, um, have a safe holiday and break and uh, have a good happy new year. Excuse me. Yes, thank you all. Excuse me. Yes, Mimi. Um, are you teaching anything for the uh, spring? Uh, spring so I am. I'm teaching this class and intro. So people, have, you've all taken those before. Um, but the two classes I'm teaching that are new would be um, so 300, which is sociological theory. And that is a fully online class. I mean, I'll post videos and stuff, but it's like, there's no, you know, plan time. And then the other class I'm teaching is SOC 370, and that is Sociology of Culture. 